Welcome back to Long Time Toolies. It's Kyle again, and I have finally the video on restoring this Stanley number no. five hand plane. I bought it on eBay not too long ago. It's been sitting around waiting for uh, me to get some time to get after it and start uh, fixing this one up. So I'm going to do a pretty, a, a relatively long video because I want to cover everything so that anyone watching it can feel comfortable if they want to start doing stuff like this. First things first, what I look for when I'm looking on eBay or in an antique shop or a flea market for an antique plane. So here we have a pretty, you know, normal run of the mill Stanley number no. five. It's a type 16 uh, so far as I can tell. I'm pretty sure that's accurate. So type 16 was like 33 to 41, 1933 to 41, I believe. It's a pre-World pre -World War II. Uh, these are, you know, one of the more sought after uh, models of the Stanley planes, just because this is when they still made really high quality planes before they went to uh, the handyman model, like I talked about in one of my other videos. So what I look for is one on the body, no chips, no cracks, uh, no big, you know, cracks in the body on the cheek. In the, in the sole of the plane uh, where it makes contact with the wood. I don't want cracks. Now you can buy them with cracks and I'll show you here. Here you can see this is a number 220 Stanley plane and someone a long time ago brazed some brass onto it. Fixed it up, I mean it still works. I really love it because it shows that somebody really needed this and used it and appreciated it so much that instead of buying a new one, they fixed the one they already had. So you can do that. It is an option, but I don't want to do that. So I look for a, a body that's not cracked or chipped or anything like that. Second thing I try to look for is the front knob and the rear tote, that they're not cracked. Um, nice and straight. You know, it's got, even up here, a lot of them you'll see right here. This is missing. That's not that big of a deal, but it, it becomes a big deal when you actually start using them. That's pretty necessary to have that go into the, the cheek of your, of your palm there or whatever it's called. So I like these to be in shape. I've made replacements of these before. If you're just getting started though, I really don't recommend your first project be a tote replacement. It is kind of time consuming and um, it's just not something you might want to jump into right away. In the front knob, I can turn these on my lathe, uh, replacements of these. It really wouldn't be that hard. It's, uh, it's just kind of a pain. And if I can buy it and it's here, I'd rather just have this. The other thing I look for is all the hardware present. I want all the, uh, all the, the frog screws. I want the tote and the knob screws to be there. I want the rear uh, depth adjuster to be there. I want all the hardware. Sourcing hardware for these is really hard because people keep the hardware. It's useful. They don't make this stuff anymore. So whatever is out there is usually new old stock or a reproduction. Um, so I like to get all the hardware. If I have all the hardware, I can source all the other parts relatively easy. The second thing, or, well, I don't even know what thing we're on looking for. Another thing I like to look for is um, no real bad pitting on the body anywhere. The body, if it's pitted, especially on the on the bottom here, it's not as it's not as useful. You can still use it, but you want a really flat, smooth surface for when you're playing in that nice wood. It doesn't skip. It doesn't scratch. It planes nice and even. So I like to look for that. Really, most of the other stuff I'll show you here, this, this blade, the plane iron, is bent and it's chipped. You'll see it's chipped. Now you can uh, straighten this out and you can grind out the chips, no problem. I went a different route and I'll show you in a little bit. Um, the other thing is, you know, I like them to be rusty. You get a, usually a little better deal if they're a little rusted and dirty. People just don't want to... Put the work in and i do i enjoy the work so i got a pretty i think i paid 32 dollars for this and then like 12 bucks in shipping not bad um 50 bucks for a, a nice plane and i like to work on them they uh they bring me joy and so i like to i don't mind a little dirt a little dirt a little character 
So now that we went over what I looked for, it is time to take this apart. I'm gonna start taking it apart and we got a lot of rusty parts and I'll show you what I do with those. All right, I got it taken apart, all the pieces, everything looks pretty good. Um, there's a lot of, of wood there, which is nice. You know, it was underneath the frog. That means someone used it, which uh, means I can probably use it too. Everything looks good. There is a lot of rust though, a lot of rust, a lot of corrosion. So a lot of these parts though, like the depth adjuster, these are brass. Rust, they don't get rust, they just get a little, I don't know if it's oxidation or whatever. And then the, the tote and the front knob, little screws, they're also brass. So those, those we don't de-rust, we're gonna polish those. So you got everything taken apart. Now what do you wanna do? You wanna get the rust off every single piece. A lot of people, they'll say, oh, just put it on a wire wheel, that'll be great. It is, but there's still a lot of little nooks and crannies where this rust goes that you can't get with a wire wheel. So I like to soak them. I like to soak them in a rust solution. That gets in every little nook and cranny. It gets all the rust off entirely. And I don't have to sit there for six hours on a damn wire wheel like an idiot when I can just pour it in a rust bath. So that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna take all this stuff, put it in a rust bath, no free ads, but this stuff is pretty great. It's safe for hands, you can put it on your skin. You know, don't like bathe in it or anything, but uh, you don't have to wear a mask or anything like that because of the fumes. I like using it and it's reusable. You can reuse it a bunch of times until uh, before it gets useless. So I like to use it. So I'm gonna get it ready, put everything in the rust bath and move on to the really fun part. You guys are gonna love it. All right, everything is in the, the rust bath. Everything's gonna soak overnight. I'll come back to it in the morning. But for now, I can still do other stuff. I have the body. You can soak the body too. A lot of people will buy like a gutter, like a, an aluminum gutter or a plastic gutter and fill it up with the rust solution. I'm gonna do that for probably the top. Now, the finish on the top of this, let me, uh, let me clean it off for you. This is called Japanning. The Japanning on this one actually looks pretty good. I don't really care too much if it looks great. You can see a lot of my other planes back here. The Japanning on them isn't perfect. Here's the number five I did the replacement tote for. I don't really care. What I care about is the bottom, the sole, and I want it to be smooth and polished and shiny because that means it's gonna do well on the wood, the smoother it is. So we're gonna put this off to the side and we're gonna move on to the next step. So what I have to do to get this ready is I'm going to wire wheel this and the cheeks, the sides here. I'm going to hit it with a wire wheel and a buffing wheel from, from uh, my eight inch bench grinder. I'm going to get that set up and then I'll show you guys, you know, just a, a couple seconds of me doing that. You don't have to watch the whole damn thing. All right. So I got the bench grinder set up. I'll show you that right here. I got that set up. I got my, the body of my plane and I got my, uh, my wire wheel, my wire wheel here. And I got the, the buffing wheel set up too, with a little bit of a uh, compound on it. So I'm going to get to work on that. Now, safety first, this shit, I don't know what's on here. You know, you could probably uh, breathe in something from the great depression with uh when you're doing work like this. So safety first, I'm gonna wear one of these, nice little full face respirator, cause this makes a huge mess when you get going on it. So make sure if you're doing it, you got an N95 mask or something like this, you don't wanna breathe that crap in. It can make you sick. Uh, who knows, you know, you could be watching those mesothelioma commercials and uh, actually have to call the number. You don't wanna do that. Safety first, gonna get to work here. I'll let you guys watch a little bit of it.
All right, got the uh, brass components and the, the body nice and polished up. So I wanna show you something before I move on. I, I took a pretty good look at it before all the rust was off. Found a little problem once the rust was off. Let's see if you can see it. Right there, a little hairline fracture. Shit happens, you know, you don't know what you're buying. That's the, the risk of buying old used tools. However, not that big of a deal. This can still be used. It's not all the way through the cheek, like uh, like you really don't want. It's just a little crack there. As long as I take care of it, don't drop it, I'll be able to use this plane for a really long time. Now, the if you don't have a grinder, I already did a, a restoration video on a Stanley number no. six. If you don't have a grinder, there's other things you can do. You can use an orbital sander. You can use a, a belt sander if you really wanted to. You can hand sand it. You can do all sorts of stuff to get the rust off. Um, the other thing on the bottom, there's a little pitting. See it, see it here, see it here. That happens, you know, it, it's the risk you take. You're never really gonna find these in perfect condition, at least not for $32. And that's something I'm willing to, to accept. If you're not, then buy, you know, a $450 Lie Nielsen plane, and that's up to you. I don't have that kind of money. I don't think a whole lot of people do uh, for a tool that's, you know, this big and probably isn't going to be used every single day. So that's what you got to put up with. Other than that, I like it. It looks good. I'm going to hit it with probably a 400 grit and a 600, 1500. Get it nice and polished up. You don't have to see that. It's just sanding stuff. No one likes sanding. But really, what I really love. Look at these little guys. Mmm, mmm, shiny. And then this, I mean, it looks brand new. I still gotta get the inside. I'll use a drill attachment, probably a little Dremel attachment to get in there and clean that up. But you don't have to see that either. Got everything polished up. Now I'm gonna go on to the next step. All right, we got the, the body polished, all the little brass parts polished. Now we gotta deal with uh, the tote and the front knob. A lot of these will have like a coat of lacquer on top they put on to, to uh, protect. I like to just strip it down to the bare wood, put a little tongue oil on it, and then put a coat of wax, a couple coats of uh, paste wax on it. So the first thing I have to do is get all the lacquer off and then nicely, lightly sand the wood because this is, you cannot replace these with new wood, new Brazilian rosewood unless you have a supplier that has access to rainforest wood, and chances are that's not legal. You can't really import this stuff unless it's carefully tracked. So that makes it wildly expensive. It's illegal to harvest it without some crazy, stupid laws to, to get by. They're not stupid, they're good. We gotta protect the rainforest, but you know what I mean. So what I like to do is to get the lacquer off and not really harm the wood, I'll take a chisel, I don't use the business end, I just use the side. And I'll just sit here and kind of chip away at the lacquer. I could put it uh, under a sander, but I don't trust myself enough to uh, carefully sand it away, all the lacquer. So I just like to chip it off. It comes off pretty easy. I mean, this shit's been on there for, you know, 80 years at this point. So we're, uh, we're just gonna keep doing this. Really not that exciting. We're gonna do it to both, sand it, and then I'll finish it. Y'all don't have to watch. Want me to just show you when I'm all done? I'll show you, I'll come back when all the lacquer's off. This shit's real boring, so. All right, toolies, I'm all done with the tote and the front knob. Took it down to the bare wood, put some tongue oil on it and a couple coats of paste wax. Not a big deal, it looks good, it feels good, it's gonna look great on the plane. I got the plane body all done. I think I'm just gonna leave it like this. Not gonna polish it up crazy. I like it, it doesn't look brand new, it's not supposed to. And it, it just, it feels good. I put a coat of paste wax on it just to protect it a little bit. Here's the uh, depth adjustment screw. I think this turned out great. This looks awesome, it's shiny, it's free of uh, dirt, it's gonna look great on that plane. Look at that, nice contrast with the wood, huh? Nice contrast, we like that, don't we? And then uh, here's the, the knob and the tote. S little screws. Couldn't ask for a better result on these. These will pop out, 
I'll put it in here. I mean, look at that. Ooh, baby, look at that. That's going to look great. I got everything, uh, everything soaking away here, getting all the rust off. What I'll do is the next time that you'll see me in this video, I will have it all out of the rust bath. And what I do, I rinse it underwater, get all the solution off, and then I put it in the oven at about 200 degrees for a few minutes just to get the water out of there. Don't tell my wife. Don't tell my wife. I swear to God, I'll kill you if you, if you tell my wife. That just helps it dry out so that there's no water sneaking, sneaking around the little nooks and crannies. When everything's out of the oven, remember, no telling, I've got a little surprise, uh, a little surprise uh, for something I, I haven't done on a plane project yet, but I, I kind of wanted to just to see how it would go. And uh, it came with a little more than I bargained for, but I have a solution for that. I'm excited to show you guys. All right, Toolies, we're back. We're gonna get back to work on the Stanley number no. five that I started restoring uh, last week. So everything got soaked in the rust solution. I'll show you here. Um, as you can see, a lot of the pieces are, I mean, they all look pretty good. Um, got all the, you know, the frog hold down. Everything's nice. The frog, nice and clean. All the rust came off. Um, all I did, I put in the rust solution, let it soak overnight and then took it out, hit it with the brass brush a little bit, um, put it into the oven at about 175 for about 10 minutes, just so all the water in the holes and the little little places you can't get to with a paper towel or something, just so the water gets out and it doesn't cause any problems down the road. Um, you'll notice everything looks pretty good, but it doesn't look brand new. I'm not necessarily restoring this, I'm just preserving this. I don't want to make it look brand new because it's not. I just want to stop the aging process with all the rust and everything so that this thing will have another, you know, 80, 90, 100 years before someone else has to do it. So we're at that point now. I'll show you the tote. The tote looks pretty good. It's not the best. Uh, all I did was I sanded it down. Probably didn't take as much time as I should have. Put a coat of tongue oil on it. Here's the knob coat of tongue oil on it and then two coats of paste wax that's what I how I like to finish these you can always reapply that turned out okay all the rest of the pieces turned out okay now here's I gave a little teaser before I cut out the last time we remember this blade the iron right the plain iron it's pretty bent as you can see it, it's it's just bent and then to top it off right here it's chipped the blade is chipped the iron is chipped. Now you can grind that back down with a grinder. You could even sit there with a, a sandpaper and a honing guide and grind it back down to get a good edge. And that's perfectly doable. And you could bend this back, heat it up, bend it back into place. You can make it usable. I went a different route. I went on and got a number five, number four, number five replacement blade from a, an online retailer that makes their own planes, really high quality stuff. This is what they make for their planes so that you can buy replacements. Now, it's not a direct swap, and here's why. This, as you can see, much, much thicker than the original Stanley iron. You can see here, it's, I don't know, I could, I could set my calipers on it, but I really don't care. It's about 33% bigger. That's a good number, right? So it's a little bigger. What this has, what this does is it creates a problem. You have the chip breaker here, you got the little chip breaker, and you got the screw that goes onto the iron that you can adjust it with. Now, typically, and I'll show you on this one backwards, typically you set it in there and it goes in and it slides, right? And then you just tighten it down. This is backwards because it's bent, or it's, it's reversed because this is bent. Now, with this, this little guy, that's a problem because this screw isn't long enough. And breaking news, it's really goddamn hard to find replacement screws for Stanley's. Not unless you want to pay, say, $10 for this. So I came up with a little solution. It might not be the most, uh, I don't know, the most eloquent, I guess could be a word. But I went and I bought some PanPhillips head screws. 
These are Mike 8 TAC 1.25 by 16. So the, the real important thing is the thread pattern here. Um, you can take your chip breaker or whatever you got to the hardware store, set the screw in it. You can see it's the same thread pattern, same, same thickness. So I know it would work, but take one of these originals out. Uh, it works if you are okay with like an inch long screw. We're not, we can't have that. It's gotta sit flush. And it's got a little bit of a rounded head, which is fine, but it won't sit flush in the frog anymore. So we had to go to work on the grinder, took a Dremel tool, cut it down, marked out how far down I needed to go, cut it down with a cutoff wheel, ground the head flat, so now that's flat, and then ground the sides flat. It's not, you know, it's not gonna pass any beauty contests, it's not gonna win any of them, but it works, it works. The other thing we had to do to get this ready, since the, yeah, I know, I tried to make it so that this would be a good intro to restoring or, or preserving planes. Sorry, you get more than you what you paid for here, though. Um, the other thing I had to do, since this iron and the chip breaker, since it was a lot thicker, it didn't quite fit through the mouth of the plane. That's a big problem. If it can't fit through the mouth of the plane, how the hell is it going to plane wood? It's not. That's a simple answer. It's not. So I had to go to work on the mouth of the plane. Now, you might not want to do this. Me, it's already got a crack on the on the cheek here. It's not going to, you know, it's, it's not a collector necessarily. Like, it's not a Stanley Bedrock or a super rare, you know, hard to find $400 Stanley plane. It's just a run-of-the-mill Stanley number no. five from like 1933. It's valuable, but I still want to be able to use it. So what I had to do, I took my little bastard file, mill bastard file, and I took and I ground down slowly, real easy. It took me like 45 minutes. I just ground the mouth a little bit wider than came stock. It's really hard to tell. I'll show you here. Really hard to tell anything was taken off but it is a, a much wider mouth. So now we got all the parts and pieces. We got everything ready to go. Everything looks great. It looks almost brand new, you know, ish. We got all of our brass polished up, looking, looking sharp. So now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna assemble the whole damn thing. So let's go ahead and put it back together, get it tuned up and put it to some wood. First things first, let's get the tote and the front knob put back on. That's pretty straightforward. that in get the rear one in the reason you want to do this first is because to get it in when the frog's in is kind of a pain in the ass and i don't want to scratch the tote trying to get it to sit in so i'll show you here why you set it here not happening you can get it in by like maneuvering it but this is just so much easier get that set nope we're gonna need some tools dummy might as well get a phillips head too so we got that set in Get the front. You really can't over tighten it. You, you still don't want to crank down too hard because even though these are really high quality uh, pieces of hardware going back in here, you can still strip the threads. And unless you got a tap and die set, you're not going to fix that. And like I said, good luck finding replacements. So the front, the tote, the knob, everything's back in. Looks great. Let's go ahead. Let's put the frog in. Frog's pretty straightforward, you know. Uh, first thing we got to do though, should have done this first. That's okay. You can still make it work. Get the uh, depth, the frog depth screw in so that we can set it. You don't want to tighten the frog hold down screws all the way. You just want to get them in there so that it still sits flat, but you want to be able to adjust the frog back and forth. So we got that set. Now put the, I forget what this is called, but it only goes in one spot, so put that there. All right, let's get the depth adjustment uh, thing back on there. Now those are reverse threaded, so uh, you're not doing lefty loosey righty tighty, you're doing lefty tighty on this. So you can just set it in there, see it'll move that around. Okay. This is where things start to get, not hairy, but you gotta start paying real close attention. Now we have our modified screw here. 
And we got our brand new, really damn nice and sharp plain iron. We're gonna get it nice and set up. Yeah, there we go. All right. And then we are going to set it in the plane. There it is set, lever cap. You'll have to keep, be patient when you do this. You're gonna have to keep adjusting. There's a lot of moving parts, not moving parts, but a lot of things to consider. A lot of geometry at play here on these hand planes. There's a lot of different things. So you gotta be patient and let it get set up or else you're just gonna have a bad product and all that time is gonna be for nothing. So here it is assembled. Great, right? Not quite, we're not done. We gotta get it tuned up. Here's what we gotta do. Go ahead and loosen the lever cap. Now the rule of thumb is you hold it, you look down, and you adjust so that you barely see the blade poking out. I mean, you just, you gotta get all that dust, but you just barely wanna see it. So now I start to see it, that's good. So we're gonna leave that as the depth, but now we gotta adjust the frog also. This is where you go back and forth, back and forth, snip, snap, snip, snap. Shout out Michael Scott, poor guy. Now you look down at it when you're doing the frog adjustment, the frog, uh, whatever, set adjustment. Look down and see, you wanna see a little bit of daylight coming between the end of that mouth and the plane, and the plane uh, iron. So we got that set. Let's see, keep that lever cap down. Now once you tighten everything up, like I said, there's a lot of moving parts. You're gonna have to keep adjusting. There we go. So this, and now we're gonna have to adjust the depth again, the depth of the blade. The other thing is the lateral adjustment. You gotta keep in mind the lateral adjustment because it's not gonna be straight. It's gonna be straight in there, but a lot of things are happening all at once and things aren't gonna be straight set from the get-go. So we see here, I can't feel it there. There we go, get, get the depth back in. Sometimes you can do it. I'm gonna loosen this to be able to do the depth adjustment by hand without loosening the, the lever cap. Yep, that didn't work out. The other thing you gotta consider is the geometry that's involved in where the chip breaker sets. This is where I really don't like what's happening because you have to have the chip breaker set on a certain part of the, the iron so that it works most efficiently. With this, since I have an original Stanley chip breaker, I didn't buy the replacement chip breaker and I probably should have and I still might, but that's changing the geometry to the point where I can't necessarily get it where I want without cheating. That feels good from the bottom. Let's tighten it up from the top. Take a look. We're going to get it a little deeper in there. Starting to see it. All right. You know what? I think we're going to put some wood on it now. We're going to get this tuned a little bit better. Uh, but the only way we can tell is if we try to plane some wood. Now... When you use a hand plane, it's not a planer. You are the planer. This is the plane, all right? Just a little, uh, just a little personal preference. Here, I got a piece of yellow pine, just a piece of scrap wood. Put it on my bench hook. Now, when you plane wood, you want, this seems pretty flat, the grain's pretty flat, but you don't want to tear it out. Now, I can see with the rise of this, that it's flowing up like this. So I want to take it like that. I want to go with the grain. I don't want to go against it because then you get tear out and all sorts of other shit. If you've never played wood before, don't worry about fucking up scrap. Don't start with a nice piece of walnut or you know purple heart or something like that. But you'll eventually you'll feel it immediately when you put it on there. Oh shit, that's right. 
We're gonna come from the other side. Forget, oh no, let's move over here. Let's move y'all over here too. There we go, all right. This is a miter saw cut out. So we're gonna start going. Mm. Big fucking dummy didn't set the locks. So here we can start to see, we're getting some, some pretty good shavings, but it's only taking it from the one side. So we're gonna go back to the other side and adjust the lateral adjustment. Then we'll need to tweak the depth. Ooh, that's too much. Feel that right away. This is a good plane though. I can feel there's not a lot of slop in the depth adjustment, which sometimes there can be a whole lot. So this thing's pretty tight. Ooh. Ooh. Look at this. That's not too bad for something I got about $60 and a couple hours in. Got a, got a couple good little curlies off this. Ooh. There we go. That's a pretty good result. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be okay with that. There's still a little tweaking you can do here and there, but for just a you know a basic hand plane that you're gonna use to smooth, maybe do some uh, taking some wood down a little bit, you can get some pretty good results. So back you up here again. That'll do it for this plane. There's still a little bit of work to do if you want. You can, uh, on yours, you can get this nice and polished up to a mere finish. I like mine to look like an old tool and I just don't feel like doing all that shit. One other thing you might need to do, and I'll, I'll take a look at mine later, is the, the sole, the bottom needs to be flat. So you might have to lap that flat on a sheet of sandpaper. You can put it on MDF or you can put it on a piece of granite. It's just gotta be a super flat surface. People put it on a nice thick pane of glass and just sit there and lap it flat. Now, when you do that, I won't show you because it's really goddamn boring. When you do that, you don't want the iron in necessarily. You, I mean, it obviously can't be extending, but you do want the frog to be placing tension on the body. So you want the frog in there, everything nice and tightened up, which reminds me, I need to tighten the frog screws back down. That's something I should probably do right after this before I forget. You want the, the tension to be on the body so that when you're lapping it flat, it's, it's what it's going to be when you're using it. Don't forget that. Now, long-term care. You just spent all this work. You don't want rust to reclaim it. So you can do a few different things. Now, on the sole, on the bottom, I like to use paste wax because then it makes it nice and smooth going across the wood. So you put a, coat, a couple coats of paste wax on it, wipe it off, that keeps it protected and makes it a lot easier to plane with. The other thing you can do on all the other metal parts, just get some three in one oil, just a nice light coat. Doesn't have to be anything crazy. Put it on an old rag, just a little bit. You'll notice you'll clean up a lot of stuff you didn't notice on it too. Put a little three in one oil, um, you know, Marines or Army, you know, those guys uh, will be familiar with CLP. This smells like CLP because it pretty much is CLP. It's uh, cleans, lubricates, and protects. It's pretty much the same exact thing. So you'll coat all the metal parts, metal pieces, put it all back together, and then you got a plane that you won't have to really do a whole lot to besides resharpen the iron a few times, depending on how much you use it, for literally the rest of your sad, pathetic life. So my sad, pathetic life, I'll probably have this one for a while. It's a real good original example. I don't know where the fuck I'm gonna put it. I got a bunch of planes in a drawer down there. 
I got all those sons of bitches, but you know what? Another tool rescued from the rust pile, and that's a good damn day. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something from it. I know I did. I got a little more than I bargained for, but it was fun. And at the end of the day, I feel good about saving this tool from, uh, you know, someone who's stupid and would just probably use it for parts because it had a little bit of rust. Other than that, I say that a lot. I've noticed since I started doing these fucking videos. Other than that, that is all we have. Make sure you follow us on Twitter and Instagram, at Longtime Toolies. We have Pinterest. You can find us there. YouTube, if you're not watching this on YouTube, find us on YouTube. Uh, what else? TikTok, but like I said, I'm too fucking old. I don't really care about TikTok. No one else does either. That matters. Um, so you can watch whatever we have up there. Maybe I'll put some more stuff. I don't know. But that's all I really have. Uh, next time, next couple videos, probably going to be fixing up this Stanley Handyman and putting a toe-to-toe -to -toe with a not shitty Stanley Handyman plane. Just so y'all can see the big difference and why these things fucking suck and why other ones don't. And Chaps and I have a big project planned. There's going to be, uh, hopefully, a little bit of an announcement. Uh, if it doesn't end up coming to fruition, then just forget I said anything and move on with your life. But if I do say something, I told you here. Appreciate you guys watching. Appreciate you guys uh, leaving comments and interacting with us. We love you guys. We love you. Love you guys. Bye.